All right, I'm back, and so are you. And we're on to part two of monosaccharides. So this would have been the first lecture, and I will share my screen. So here we go on our journey, continuing. So this, oops, so sorry. This is a picture of monosaccharides. Uh, you don't have to memorize this, of course, because it's open book. Uh, and it just shows you a review. Triose is three carbons, four carbons, five carbons, six carbons. So let's look at the pentoses. And there's four of them. And the reason there's four is these crosshairs are the chiral positions. So the top carbon in any of these, because they're aldehydes, has a double bonded O. So it is not chiral. You have to have four single bonds to be chiral. And the bottom carbon on every single one of these pictures on this page is also not chiral because it has two hydrogens. So the middle carbons, the ones that are shown as the branches on our Charlie Brown Christmas trees, those are the chiral ones. I don't know what this purple means on any of these, but the furthest chiral one, which is the pink one, all the OHs are to the right. Um, and that is why they're all D on this whole page, uh, because D are the ones that are biologically active. All right, if we look at the pentoses, they have three chiral carbons, so one, two, three. And the rule is two to the third power, so two to the number of chiral carbons tells you how many stereoisomers there are. And so this would have two to the third power, so two times two times two, which is eight. There's only four pictured here because I was thinking I should live stream this so you guys can give me answers and I would go, oh, John got it right. Because it doesn't show the other four that are all L, the enantiomers would be uh, not shown here, but let's see. We're gonna do a quick review. And so some terminology. It's up to you if you wanna pause me at the end of the page and write these down, but you, hopefully you still have them in your notes. So this is what I just went through. If N, we say, is the number of chiral carbons, then two to the N is the number of stereoisomers, including both Ds and Ls. Aldohexoses would have had four chiral carbons, so they would have 16. So the picture on the previous page showed eight, and then all the Ls would make it 16. Okay, the word enantiomer. Does anybody know what that is? Jamie, I see your head, hand up. And you're saying, yes, it is the mirror images. So it's when we say left-handed and right-handed. All right, and the disastermers. Oh, and this one, this one needs to go to, anybody remember the diastereomers? These are the ones that are not the mirror image. So they're not mirrors. Uh, and so we're gonna see an example of those today. So those were on the previous page. It showed you the examples. And there is one other term, which is animers. Uh, and these are the alpha and beta. So alpha is the fish swimming down below and beta is the bird uh, going up high. So you guys don't get to see all my jiggles and wiggles because we took my picture off the top, but if for some reason you all want to, we can eventually put that back. All right, so we're gonna go through four monosaccharides. And these, there are more, as you saw on that slide. These four you do need to know uh, and be familiar with because we're gonna see them throughout this week. And this one, I moved this to the very first one because we're gonna see it again at the end of the term. And this is ribose. And if you saw a picture like this in your homework, you should be able to tell me it is a D aldopentose. So this is an aldehyde, double bonded O at number one. Five carbons makes it a pentose, and this OH is to that side. Now in nature, it really doesn't exist like this, all strung out. I'll have a picture in a moment of what it really looks like. Uh, what you need to know about ribose is it is a D aldopentose. It is the sugar in our genetic material, meaning our DNA and RNA. So what RNA stands for is ribonucleic acid. So ribose is an RNA, but if we move the oxygen, so this is what it really looks like. Sorry, this is ribose over here. Uh, this one actually shows the carbons, and you can see when we drew our pentagons and hexagons in the previous slideshow, I leave out the carbons and the hydrogens. I do show the OHs. 
Um, but at carbon number two, and this is really funny because this would be an OH, but when it's in RNA and DNA, it bonds to something else. That's why I didn't show it, but um, so it'd be in the beta form. But at number two, if the OH becomes an H, it's then called deoxyribose. So that D would stand for the DNA, uh, the D in DNA. So ribose is part of our genetic material, and it is also part, sorry, I, it is why in that very first slide in the previous one, there's the pentagons. Um, so those pentagons are these pentagons of ribose. And it's a pentagon, not the hexagon, because it is five carbons. Um, and so the fifth carbon is coming off the ring. The other place we find ribose is in ATP. Uh, and so there's ribose. Uh, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, so it has three phosphates. And when we cut off one of these phosphates, that bond has just the right amount of energy and it provides us with energy. So we're going to see it later. You don't need to be able to draw these molecules yet. <laughs> That's at the end of the term. So we come back and look at ribose uh, the last two weeks, but it is part of ATP. It's also part of NADH and cyclic AMP, which are molecules of metabolism, uh, which we will come back and study at the end. So for now, you should just know it's part of DNA and RNA, and it's also part of ATP. All right. So the next one, this is the big one of all the carbohydrates we do. This is the most important molecule. Uh, and it sure looks like an elephant. Remember the elephant in our kitchen? Sure looks like that elephant sat on this guy because that is a hexagon. You're saying, what? That is glucose. Uh, and glucose is our molecule of energy. It is what provides us with energy. This picture up here is trying to show you, so this is our nice hexagons that we like to draw. And actually, glucose does not look like that. And so this dark line is trying to say it comes out of the page at you. Uh, and so actually, it looks like this. And so people who take higher level organic chemistry, they learn the boat and the chair configuration. Sometimes I wanted to show this picture because you may see it shown this where they rotate it. I'm going to be, when we draw them, I recommend we go with this, but in case I showed this picture on purpose, because we will see sometimes where we will run into pictures like this or this, and you just, I just want to make sure you recognize, okay, that's just a hexagon. All right, you, what you need to know about glucose, here's glucose, is it is an aldohexose, uh, and you do not need to remember that it goes right, left, right, right, uh, and this is, of course, the alpha form, because it is pointing down. It is found freely in our blood in the alpha and beta in about a 50-50. Uh, it's always going back and forth until it makes a bond, which is what our next slideshow is about. Uh, glucose is also known as dextrose. Uh, and so if it is given intravenously, it is called dextrose. And it is blood sugar. It is a sugar that is in your bloodstream that provides every cell in your body with energy. Uh, and so there's the dextrose. So whenever you get an IV, you would always have dextrose in there because they have to maintain a certain level of blood sugar. All the tissues in your body need it. Um, and your brain especially wants sugar. Um, we're going to talk about the problem with that later. So the central nervous system, that's what that stands for. And the other cells in your body that absolutely love sugar are your red blood cells. They actually have no choice. They have to use glucose. Uh, and so if you don't have the glucose in there, they, we, we have a way, our body actually has a way to make glucose. So if you actually took no food in, um, your body starts converting other things into glucose. So your red blood cells can keep bringing the oxygen around because if there's no oxygen and no fuel, you're like sitting duck in the water, I guess. All right, and it's kind of fun out right now because these ducks are coming back and quacking and they're, they're in their mating season, I guess. All right, so the body has many ways to make. When we talk about metabolism, we'll look at those. Uh, this apparently is the most abundant molecule in nature. I did not know that until uh, every time I show this slide. All right, so what it's famous for is hypoglycemia when we have low blood sugar. Of course, since you had to watch this on a slideshow, if you start feeling faint or weak or dizzy, 
you to pause me and go take a walk and maybe if you haven't eaten and hyperglycemia is diabetes uh, and we'll talk about that but if you have really high blood sugar it is because your cells are not taking it in um, something's going on and so your body starts peeing so it's actually the polyurea is a key sign because uh, you're trying to get rid of all this extra glucose and because you're peeing a lot you're really thirsty um, and then you're just not getting enough fuel because even though you're eating it's not getting in you and you feel tired all the time um, all right we're gonna come back and talk about diabetes in a few minutes we're gonna look so glucose was our second monosaccharide here's our third one which is galactose and this slide looks interesting because these guys are disasters of each other so they look really almost exactly the same except right there that OH is flipped. So they're both in this case in the beta position uh, and it is at the carbon number four. You don't need to know that. What you do need to know about galactose and glucose is they are both aldohexoses. And because they are both aldohexoses, they are the disastermers. All right, and where we find galactose, so you have to be careful how I word this. Galactose is not milk sugar lactose is so if we remove the ga glucose plus galactose is going to make milk sugar and so it is part of lactose which is milk sugar uh, and galactose is actually really important for our brain when we are infants and growing so mother's milk of course we would have an enzyme to break it down uh, and lactose down into glucose and galactose uh, and it's also important when we talk about glycolipids galactose shows up there which are very common in the brain which is part of this um, most galactose however is converted in our liver to glucose there is a genetic disorder called galactosemia and you would know if it ran in your family because um, you die before you're two because if you do not have the enzyme to convert it, the galactose builds up in the brain and you end up um, with not having normal mental capacity. So um, cataracts, liver failure, and death. Um, yeah, so not good things. This was really interesting and I just learned about this like two years ago from a book that I always recommend in the first lecture, uh, and that is a book called How Not to Die. Um, so it is written, this, this uh, doctor, his grandmother uh, was only 60, he was a young boy, and his grandmother was diagnosed with heart disease um, and told she had like three to six months. Uh, and so the family shipped her off to California to this place uh, that she stayed for three months, and it was a vegan farm. It was a doctor, um, Dr. Pritikin, who, so this is back, I think in the 60s, uh, and she, she went in in a wheelchair, um, and probably on oxygen, she would be today, and she walked out on her own two feet, lived to be in her 90s, 30 more years, uh, inspired her grandson to become a doctor, and then he's dedicated his life to reading journal articles, and he put together a book. Uh, first thing I do when I get a book is look in the back to see if it references. And this book, a third of the book seems to be references. Um, it is, if you decide you wanna get it, I highly recommend it. It's very sciencey, it goes through lots of, he also has a website, um, which is Nutrition Facts. Dot com and so a lot of my information actually comes from his website as well as other books that I'll keep referencing but I highly recommend the book um, it's pretty thick but I don't read books from front to back you're gonna hear me refer to this book many times I read parts of chapters um, and then I'll go back um, this book though is the book that changed Joey and he became also vegetarian and again I don't say vegan because uh, we occasionally have honey, occasionally have salmon. I talk about salmon in two weeks. All right, but we were on the train and I met a gentleman who had Parkinson's. I recognized because he had the tremor. Um, and he told me about this. And then when I came home, I happened to, or when I got to my mom, she has this book. I got her onto the How Not to Die book. And I looked it up in there and he does talk about it, that there is a link um, 
and they claim it could be as much as a 17% increase in the incidence of Parkinson's and Huntington's. Um, there's also, interestingly enough, an increase in bone fractures, and capital C A is my abbreviation for cancer. Um, it also lowers your uric acid. Uric acid is actually a huge antioxidant for our brain. Uh, and so, yeah, something to think about. All right, we'll talk about dairy more when we get to proteins. So the fourth monosaccharide that you need to be familiar with is fructose. And fructose, oh, it's not an aldehyde because the double bonded O is not at the top. And yeah, it has six carbons. So it is a D ketohexose and it's gonna make a pentagon. And a reminder, number one is not in the pentagon because it's before the double bonded O. So this is where the double bonded O would be. It's pointing up. So this is beta because the OH points up. So this is carbon one down here, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so fructose is a ketohexose. So before I move on, it is a hexose. So it is considered an isomer of glucose, but it is not a stereoisomer or a disastromer because it's not an aldehyde. Um, fructose is the sweetest of all the natural sugars. It's the sweetest of them all. Uh, it is found in honey and in fruit sugar. So that's where the name comes from is fruit sugar, so fructose. And the bad news is HFCS is high fructose corn syrup. More on that in two slides. And the good news, we're gonna do the good news first, is raw honey and fruit and before you get too excited, somebody already picked the topic of honey, um, but this was a really cool fact. Uh, somebody always picks honey because it's an amazingly awesome topic and there's so much information. Uh, one pound of honey, that would be bees pollinating two, that is million flowers and flying 50,000 miles for that one pound of honey. And so, and you get your honey from the farmer's markets, which will open again, um, that, yeah, respect the bees, get raw honey. Uh, all right, so raw honey, some of the things, I'm gonna go through this really fast, you don't need to know it, you just need to know, it is really all good news. Um, there are people who are the honey gatherers, and they pretty much, they will sometimes just have like, it's, the story I heard, a pint of honey they will consume, and then they'll go out to get honey, collect honey, and so they won't eat again for like a day or two or three days. Um, and so the honey is just sustains them because your body does not store it as fat, it stores it um, for energy. All right, it is used for dry throat and cough. Um, I learned that when I was in uh, Chinese medical school. It promotes fat usage, so it, it coats um, the throat. And again, this has to be raw honey, uh, not what you buy in the honey bear, which is high fructose corn syrup. If you have one of those, there's some really cool experiments you can do. Uh, it does actually promote your body from honey. Your, it actually promotes your body to use fat. Um, I don't want you to go and start eat, drinking a quart of honey a day. I'm not saying that. These were these people are extremely active and climbing these trees, um, but it is something to think about. It helps maintain blood sugar, muscle recovery, glycogen restoration. So a little bit in your tea as your sweetener of choice. Uh, DM is diabetes, workout recovery. So there's some information on all of that. Um, it actually helps with constipation. It's used in Chinese medicine for that. And Dr. Liu would say, you need to coat the intestines so the boat will float right through smoothly. Um, I remember that quote directly. Uh, it is used actually in burn clinics. So I had a student who worked as a LPN in a burn clinic and she came back 
to finish your chemistry to go on for more nursing school. And it is used for burns. Um, and the reason for that is it is a super saturated solution, uh, which means it has actually more sugar in the solution than can be in there. And that's why when you start using your honey, sometimes you get a layer on top. Um, but because it's super saturated, when you put it on the burn, it will actually pull uh, water out and it dehydrates the bacteria. Um, and yeah, I guess there's something also about peroxide. I don't remember right now, but it is an amazing thing for people with allergies. Um, Noveli, I believe that's what you had told me why you had taken, if you take honey that is local because the bees uh, pollinated the local, um, yeah, local flowers. Uh, it helps people with allergies and it's filled with enzymes and minerals. And again, it has to be raw, unfiltered. Uh, and yeah, the propolis is, I believe, the queen bee's um, poop. And it is just loaded like the mother food of everything, of flavonoids and antioxidants. Um, and your liver stores the honey the fructose in the honey. Honey actually has fructose and glucose and it stores it as glycogen for energy. It never stores it as fat. Um, and Pythagoras lived apparently to be 90, Pythagorean theorem, and he said you should eat uh, bread with honey every morning. And apparently Hippocrates lived over 100. I don't know if that's true. This is from a book when I was in Chinese medical school. Um, and they both were big proponents of honey. Of course, they only have raw honey then. All right. So high fructose corn syrup. If you want to be like the conspiracy theory, you want to be the person who talks about poisons in our food and educate everybody in those class presentations in the last week. Um, yeah, high fructose corn syrup. I Most people... People are scared of this one, uh, and you should be. And when you watch the video for lab two, so next week, although you can watch it this week, sunny out this week, so wait till the rain comes. Uh, 1975, average person consumed about half a pound. This is when they figured out. So corn syrup is made up of fructose and glucose. And what they did is they do a step where it becomes a little bit more fructose. It's actually not that significantly different. So you actually, in most things, you will find it has corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup, so you're getting it twice. But it was around that year that they figured out how to do this. It is a liquid, so in all the soda that is now consumed, it went up in that 24 year span, and I'm sure none of you were alive yet, but I was, uh, and it just mind boggles me what has happened to our diet. Um, and in 2012, the thing that was interesting, and now the numbers have actually decreased for high fructose corn syrup, but it is so minimal. Our total calories from sweet is still abysmal, um, and it's because we switched to other things. This is a crazy, um, from one of my students a couple years ago, did a paper on high fructose corn syrup. And if they fed rats high fructose corn syrup, they only lived five weeks. A normal lifespan for a lab rat who's not fed the awful stuff. And there's our lab rat. He's a little worried. He's like, am I going to be the control rat? I'm hoping I'm the control rat. All right. I think those paws are real. I like looking at it now. All right, fructolysis. So lysis is to break down fructose. Uh, this happens only in the liver. So if you consume fructose, it can only be broken down in the liver. And oh, there's another picture of the increase in obesity and the increase in high fructose corn syrup. Um, you know, causation is not, it doesn't prove it because the correlation and causation, whatever that quote is, uh, but pretty much if you look at what's happened, it is. Uh, liver stores high fructose corn syrup as fat. So totally opposite of the previous slide. Honey, mother nature, our body goes, oh, this is amazing. And that is because, as I mentioned, I went to school for Chinese medicine after I got my doctorate in biochemistry. Um, because I very much know we're energetic beings. 
And the food we put in our body has an energy footprint. And so when you eat from Mother Nature, your body knows what to do with that. And when you eat this stuff that man has made, the footprint, the energetic footprint, your body, your liver goes, what the heck is this? And it just stores it as fat. That's the backup. And that's what's happening. Because we've synthesized all this unnatural food and we've become fat. All right, you end up with a fatty liver disease. So the sugar-coated movie is the one with the doctor from um, UCSF who has really come out with lots of stuff on this. Um, he, Because he started, he went into pediatrics because he didn't want to treat, he didn't like the smell of alcoholics. So he went into pediatrics and then he said he's dealing with the same thing he would have. 20 years before with alcoholics is these kids are having fatty liver disease just like an alcoholic and it is because of the consumption of high fructose corn syrup. There is also something called fructosylation uh, which is the cross-linking of fructose with parts of your body. Glucosylation also happens. Um, and that is what they look at and say, why diabetes is so awful, all the glucose. And so they will recommend, oh, you should take fructose because it doesn't cause a rise in your glucose levels. You have high glucose instead. And guess what? It causes seven times more damage, but they don't tell you that. And the reason they don't tell you that is not because they're evil, it's because they don't know. They did not learn that and they are not willing to keep reading and realize. And right now our medical system's a little busy with other things, but we are going back to normal. Um, and so you guys can be educated. And again, you can look into this. This could be your paper. Um, it is a much higher risk factor for diabetes than actually the glucose. So eat, eat natural, neat fiber, and that's World Health Sugar Guidelines. We're not gonna go there. We're gonna look at this slide. This was from Top 10 Home Remedies, but it was just a cool slide. Uh, and high fructose corn syrup is weight gain, type two diabetes, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, which is blood fat in your blood. Uh, it can lead to gout, which is people always have that soreness, uh, the fatty liver, which is the same thing that happens to alcoholics. Your liver does so much. Um, and your kidneys. Yeah, nothing, nothing good on this slide. It doesn't do anything good. All right, this picture, this graph um, overwhelmed me when I saw it because it is the amount of high fructose corn syrup in our diet and the amount of overweight children, um, which showed a perfect correlation. Uh, let's see, and these are all the foods in which you have hidden high fructose corn syrup. Number one is yogurt. People sit there and say, I have yogurt for breakfast. I have a very healthy breakfast. Oh, if you are one of those people who has yogurt or puts yogurt in your smoothie, go look at it. And yeah, a lot of bread products. Um, oh yeah, cocktail peanuts. Yeah, I get raw peanuts. Um, and when bulk bins come back, you can get them. Salad dressings. We'll be talking about salad dressings next week. Uh, you're going to start making your own. It's really awesome and it's very delicious. All right, tomato sauces, crackers, uh, Oreos, cough syrup, right? Uh, pre made stuffing, bottled teas. It's like in everything. And this was a slide many years ago. You can see. Some, some people weren't even born yet, were you? No, you should have been. All right, we're selling overpriced hydrogenated trans fats, high fructose corn syrup, so we can buy insulin injections. And that's kind of how I feel when they come to my door, I make a donation. And this is another one. So there's Tony there. Oh, I guess the burp. McDonald's and General Mills each spend, the slide is 10 years old. Oh, look at that. Um, this, this is from 20 years ago, so this number is even higher. That is a billion dollars. Whereas our National Cancer Institute budget to promote fruit and vegetables and the budget has really not gone up. It was about a million dollars. That's why their graphics 
are so old because they don't have any money to promote fruits and vegetables. Uh, super Size Me, there's a second Super Size Me came out, but this becomes an extra credit much later in the term. So don't watch it yet because there's some things that happen in the movie. And once we start looking at things, you will watch that movie in a very different way because of what happens to him. It's an awesome movie. This is uh, one of my favorite slides. So Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? Eat Kentucky Fried Chicken and help fight breast cancer. You're going to guarantee you're going to get it. And they're vegan chicken. It is highly processed. Um, so every piece, this is great. How much do one of those buckets? This is these huge buckets. They cost like, I don't know. I haven't been in Kentucky Fried Chicken for decades and decades. I don't think Joey has ever had Kentucky Fried Chicken. I don't know. Oh, well, one time he did, he said. Um, 50 cents from like, they're still making like, 10 15 dollars a bucket and they're giving 50 cents a bucket um yeah so that's a fail so 1996 so i know the statistics old this before joey was born but i got it from a book that i absolutely love and really the numbers were better in 1996 so 42 percent of americans ate cake cookie pastries or pie of some sort in any given day and right now with everybody home well hopefully they're making their own but that number is probably 95 percent so this is the question, how many ate dark green veggies? Oh, 10%. Oh, the number now is lower. That's the part that is so sad. Um, yeah, Cookie Monster chose his cookie. So there are three vegetables that account for half of US veggie servings. And I think it is actually more than half now, but three vegetables. So go ahead, think, write down. It's where if I had again that live stream, you could all be like sending me answers. Oh, I think it's this, this, this. Um, yes, somebody said it. Somebody said potatoes. And you are right because of French fries and potato chips. Potatoes are amazing and they've been so badly maligned, but they are not good when you deep fry them. Um, yeah, so potatoes. Number two is head lettuce. Head lettuce is totally useless. Lettuce is freaking amazing, but head lettuce, yeah, it's the least nutrient-dense food uh, that comes from Mother Nature, probably. All right, and then number three. Oh, I gotta love it, the tomatoes, because it's in ketchup, it's in pizza sauce, yeah. And remember, Barack Obama, lunch lady pizza is a serving. Um, and so let's just start piling it on. 32 teaspoons of sugar per day, apparently was the average, it's 1996. You think we've really got better? Because we've gotten a lot fatter. Eat your veggies, eat your veggies, especially mushrooms. We'll talk about mushrooms in the next slideshow. All right, there we go. And who's that? King Kong is trying to sell Godzilla. Eat your vegetables. So let's talk about diabetes. And yeah, diabetes, glucose, we're talking about monosaccharides. Um, so this is a picture that if you've never seen, it shows the increase. And as it gets darker and darker, and I think it ends at 2010, uh, but the whole country becomes darker and darker. And so I haven't, we have to wait till the census and until we get to the 2020 ones. But these are estimates that from 1958 to 2010 went from 1.5 million to 25.8 million. These numbers, again, I got from How Not to Die. 8.3% um, of the US population, 7 million don't know they have it. Um, and so in 2010, 1 1.9 million alone were diagnosed in this country. Healthcare numbers are abysmal, insane. And then when you look at the obesity rates, and these numbers are actually higher. They estimate um, the number they picked for the BMI was a random number. Doctors even admit it. And so the percentage of Americans that are overweight is actually estimated to be like in the 80%. And the obesity rate is even higher. But it is down here in the South. I went to school just down here in North Carolina. Uh, and it was, you'd go and watch people drink their iced tea. And they would just keep adding the sugar until there was like a two inch layer at the bottom of the glass. And then they put the straw in. So they're pretty much just drinking up the sugar. Um, and this was something I recently learned. And there's another statistic. Um, and the colors on this graph are harder to see, but these are the least happiest states also. 
And again, correlation is not causation or causation, whatever it's called. But uh, you guys all know when you're feeling bloated and you didn't eat something right. So imagine walking around all day feeling bloated and awful. Uh, we rank as a really happy state. Look at that. Montana, Wisconsin, Nebraska. Go figure. Utah. All right. Utah is also the highest Prozac uh, state. So and the most jello eaten kind of weird stuff. So diabetes, back to diabetes, it is a disease of affluence. It is called the black death or the plague of the 21st century. So instead of carrying around the bubonic plague by fleas and rats, which is interesting because right now we are the rats, which is why you need to stay home, make yourself a mask if you go out because um, the only way we're going to get past this is we all work together and it's this beautiful thing that's happening because right now every country is closed for business everyone is home in every country isn't that amazing the amount of love that we can be sending on this planet right now anyway so in developing countries one in every six have diabetes um yeah, it's the, the pandemic that is going to be happening. Um, and so that it is, the cause is a high fat, high calorie diet. That word is fat, not carbohydrate. And we will get into this more as we go through. It is a high, yes, there we go. I am going to be dare enough to say it is animal based diets. The studies go back to the 50s, the 40s. Um, and whenever they took groups of people who were diabetic and they put them on the low carb diet, high animal protein, high fat, they saw no improvement or worsening. And when they put them on the no animal based diet, they couldn't believe it. They, in fact, those people always had nurses because they were sure being on a high carb diet was going to send their diabetes out the roof. Now, the reason this is important, it was in the 40s and 50s. This is before processed food. So they had to eat real food. Um, yeah, so it was before Lay's potato chips and all that stuff. So high blood glucose is the effect, not the cause. Um, so the cause is basically the advertisements, the enticements, and this. So intramyocellular lipid means inside the muscles. So this is going in your muscle cells, and when they actually look at it, it is just coated with fat. Uh, and so the receptors are coated with fat. Insulin is there, it can't get in to the receptor. So it's like putting a bunch of peanut butter into your keyhole and you can't get it through. Anyway, it comes up the insulin receptor. Uh, decreasing fat in the diet decreases diabetes. And I know there's a whole bunch of you going, what are you talking about, Sherpa? That is not what Joe Rogan says. Joe Rogan says you need a high fat diet. And go ahead, that can be all the guys in there. I am not a fan of Joe Rogan, but, and there's a whole bunch of people and we will get into that. Just calm down. My motto is keep it real. Uh, diabetic children live 20 fewer years, uh, but we can reverse that. And yeah, all right. Seventh leading cause of death in the US. Uh, 79 million, 37%, the adult population, and it's predicted to be 50%. 68% of the people with diabetes die from heart disease or stroke. Um, doubles your risk. It's double the risk as versus those of us who do not have diabetes. Uh, and so the question is is this higher rate actually due to the medications? Because there is also. Um, high insulin causes issues, and that's a whole nother talk. All right, studies show prediabetes and diabetes can be prevented and reversed by decreasing your weight, which you all know, by physical activity, absolutely. It's a combination, and a whole food, plant-based diet, keep it real. And so we can go with this treatment, or we can go with just keep it real. You don't have to count anything. You don't have to worry about it. Oh my gosh, no meat. That's really drastic. Wait, no cheese, no dairy, no cheese. Cheese does not count. Cheese is a vegetable, right? All right. Well, which is more drastic? Eating kale or, yeah. So in 1964, when the Surgeon General said smoking is bad for you, 
Oh, we did actually decrease smoking until recently when this fad came about. And then, okay, maybe our bodies, they're designed to eat meat, right? Because we walk on four feet. Oh, like my cat and dog? Uh, I don't think so. Our intestines are actually much too long to be carnivores. So your cat and dog, their intestines are actually proportionally much shorter because that way everything gets through it faster because they're not getting the fiber. Um, and also our pH of our stomach is actually not correct to be a carnivore. But you're like, oh, but our teeth, I know our teeth are meant to be an omnivore. I'm supposed to be an omnivore. That is an omnivore. Is that what your teeth look like? Do you guys have things like that? I actually, so you don't get to see me right now. Now you're all going to look at me when you're on the video. Um, I have things. My dentist growing up would say, oh, those are, yeah, because my brother and sister, they are not like that. They are like this. They, that one tooth is pointed. But we are actually most similar to these, which means we should be eating fruits and vegetables. Uh, you can stop it and read this. I'm going to move on. Let's talk about fruits. So we're almost done. There's three more slides. Usually I'm running out of time to have to talk really fast and I don't have to. You can pause me anytime you want. So three fruits per day plus berries. So it's really four. And I, I have to make a confession here. Let me go through a slide. I, I do two apples a day and then also berries. Um, so girls are smaller than boys use. And um, yeah, there's some of these numbers these are recommendations from Dr. Greger and I did a yoga class and all the girls were like, I can't eat that much food physically. And the teacher who was a male kept arguing with us, but um, all right, 2010, this is at the time was the largest meta analysis. So that's where they do the computer analysis of all the data that's been out there. It was billed by uncle Bill uh, and Melinda. Uh, it was the largest analysis of death and disease risk factors. And the U.S. leading cause of death and disease is diet. And smoking is not. Smoking has been replaced. And it is because we eat like this. We eat like we dress. We eat beige and bland and highly processed and fried and like cookie monsters, like which one should I eat? Eat the rainbow. All right, so what was the worst parts of our diet? Number one, number one in this huge biggest meta-analysis was not eating enough fruit. And they do it again in 2020. Oh, it's probably gonna be even more miserable. So you have a choice. You always have a choice. So you get to make a healthy change for the month. And some of you saw my original email from two weeks ago and have told me you've started a change or you've watched the video and that's great. And if you haven't, uh, that's okay. Start this week and you do it for one month. So just keep track. Okay, I started on April 9th. In fact, April 8th or 9th would be a great time to start because I believe April 9th, which would be Wednesday at like two in the morning is the full moon. And so you can do from full moon to full moon, which is until like May 7th. And so that's when I think I have it due. Um, and you just tell me, keep track, just you'll know what you decide to do. So you know what I'm going to do instead of giving up something, say I'm going to eat three pieces of fruit a day. They have tons of fruit in the store. All right, people are not hoarding fruit except in my house. Fruit sugar is bound to the fiber. This is where my class, I remember last spring, it was so fun. They were like, I can eat fruit. And they all started bringing fruit to class. And everybody would sit there in class and eat their fruit. And it was so much fun. Uh, and their grades were phenomenal. Um, and they were all so happy. And at the end of the month, the little essays they wrote up to me, they, they sent me emails. And they just said, you know, they're, all these things started happening. Uh, and so there is a myth out there that fruit is way too high in sugar. Oh, if you have a fruit juice, it is. But when you have the whole food, the fruit sugar is actually bound to the fiber. The fiber does this really cool thing where the first part of your small intestines is your du duodenum or duodenum, whatever, whoever your anatomy teacher was. Um, and the fiber actually makes this coating over it. And so you can't absorb the fruit sugar or not all of it. You do absorb some. Um, and the fiber also slows down the absorption. So a lot of the fruit sugar actually makes it to the next part 
of your intestines, which is where your microbiome is, where the bacteria is. That is so grateful for fiber. You get a slower absorption. Boost your DNA repair, not the sugar, but all those colors I mean you got phytochemicals in there, plant um, antioxidants. And oh, okay, well, there we go. Cookie Monster, and I don't know who this guy is. They're eating their fruits, but they're not the B-Day boy. This is the B-Day boy. He is eating his apple. He eats three apples a day, and that is Joey, my son, and his birthday is next Saturday. And so we're going to sing happy birthday to him. So happy birthday to you. Next Saturday, you can sing a happy birthday to you. You can all send an email. You can send me an email for Joey. In fact, in Chinese culture, Chinese medicine, um, it is the mother that is celebrated on the birthday because the mother is the one that gave birth. Uh, so on my birthday, I always call my mom. And so my mom actually doesn't even try to call me anymore. She waits. And then she tells my twin brother, well, Joyce called me. Now I'll call you because my twin brother still hasn't gotten it. Um, so you can, you can send me an email next Saturday, April 11th to wish Joey a happy birthday. All right. If it's anybody else's birthday this term, let me know. And we'll, I'll put a slide in about you. Um, be fun. All right. So berries. Um, let's all praise the berries. You know, what an awesome topic. And it is spring and berries come in in the next month or so. Strawberries first, and then we live in an amazing place. But they are packed with the most vibrant antioxidants. That's why they have vibrant colors. Their skin color attracts insects to spread the seeds. And so which berry is the best berry to eat? Oh, you're all saying it. And somebody said strawberries because they love strawberries. I love strawberries. And oh my gosh, wouldn't that be an awesome topic? Look at this. Look at all that chemistry stuff you can talk about because your topic does have to be about the chemistry as well as some other cool stuff. But yeah, I get the chemistry in there. Uh, and oh, somebody else is saying blueberries. I've heard blueberries. And then I had a kid tell me they're not actually blue. That is blue. It is when you put it in a smoothie, they do often turn purple. And yeah, you can add mint. Go buy some mint and put it in your garden. And then you can put fresh mint in your berries. Oh, and then there's blackberries. So some people now are saying it's blackberries because the darker the berries, that means you have more phytochemicals and you have uh, aranthocyanin. So, uh, and that is like anything that's purple has this and it's the mother of all antioxidants. You know what? You want all of them. And so eating a variety. So we have a smoothie every day. Uh, it is made not with yogurt. Um, and I actually put greens from my, and that's what the next slide is. So no, it's not. The next slide is about free radicals. Sugar causes free radicals um, as well as stress uh, and high cooking and smoking. And this is what oxidation is. That is not oxidized. When you leave the apple out, that's oxidation. And that's what free radicals do to your cells. So this is a simple cartoon of it. Free radicals cause damage. High sugar diet, high sugar in your blood causes damage. Uh, and so oxidative stress, we talk about this again towards the end of the term, but I keep coming back to free radicals. Free radicals are not good. And sugar, high sugar, high processed food causes high levels and you end up with this advanced glycation end product. Awesome acronym also stands for age or yeah. And it is causes aging, all the things of aging. So you can think of wrinkly skin, heart disease, cause you get scarring of your vessels, uh, anything you want to think of cancer. Um, but yeah, diabetes, all the long-term effects. So if you look at people who are older and their legs are swollen and they have the, funky veins in their legs. All right. Um, so that looked delicious. So one of your later labs is to make a healthy recipe. So take something you absolutely love and you're going to redo the recipe and make it even better and feel great about serving it. Uh, so these are degenerative diseases that are linked to simple and refined carbs, diabetes, heart disease, that is high blood pressure, and I cannot say cancer enough, cancer lives on sugar. It's all it can live on. 
You cannot have sugar ever. Refined sugar. Um, no, that's not the same as eating fruit. You should definitely eat fruit, lots of fruit. Um, high cholesterol, lipids, homocysteine, we talk about all those in the next couple of weeks. Obesity, especially around the bellies, all skin issues. Holy moly, skin issues. Anemia, bone loss, tooth decay, PMS symptoms, cataracts, migraines, like all these things. Low concentration, uh, you either you're going to be talkative or shy or aggressive or just think negatively. Um, so men become more violent and women just start feeling self-pity and all of you are like, yeah, that's true. There was a study on young men who were, had behaved badly. And so the juvenile delinquents is what we called them in the old days. Uh, and so they were locked away for their month or two and they took away the candy machines and the soda machines. And I'm just sitting there thinking, wait, these kids had candy machines and soda machines. But what they found is they decreased the rates of suicide to zero and the violent activity by like 80% or something. And all they did was take away the candy and the soda, which they should take away from all kids. Uh, and I love this quote. So you just keep desiring more and more of the sweet things. Oh, the slide. Sugar destroys your brain. I know I mentioned your brain loves glucose. It wants it from whole food. Uh, and two commercial baked goods per week. Here we go. Here's the easy bake brain cookies. Two commercial baked goods per week doubles the depression rates. Uh, and so think about this. So right now we can't go to the store. So I was thinking this is a good thing because people are not, people are baking at home. So your home baked food is not the same as commercial baked. Although we talking about how to make it even better uh, and to taste even better. And so it's cutting out the sugar and you really don't miss it. The first week is hard. You will go through, but depression. Yeah, that is really what the little bonbons look like. Uh, and the question is why? Well, it's the free radicals. So this is a normal molecule and the free radical, he's missing. Yeah, he's going to still, he's got his eye on that electron and he wants it. But here comes the antioxidant, which comes from your fruits and vegetables. So oxidative stress. Here we go. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll come back to the shrinking brain. Sugar is addictive. This is a normal brain activity. So red means you have normal dopamine levels. And this is somebody on cocaine who's a coke addict, cocaine, not Coca-Cola. That's the same thing, Coca-Cola, sugar, overweight people, they get to a point where they just have to have more. And again, those movies do an amazing job, I think. Um, so that's, that's not due, that's week two lab because I figured you could dye your eggs for Easter. Um, all right. Uh, it overstimulates the dopamine center, and so that's what this picture is. Uh, and there's the brain shrinkage. This is a real picture. This is from Harvard University brain scans. I sure as heck want my brain to look like this. This is the brain of somebody who has had sugar. Actually looks like that. It was the chapter on Alzheimer's that is when I stopped allowing Joey to have meat. I read it out loud to Joey and he stopped eating it. And that's in the how not to die. And I was like, and I, I know all this information. I've seen it before, but it was just how he presented it. It really, uh, in the studies, I was like, holy moly, those studies I'd never seen. So eat your fruits and vegetables, do the rainbow. Nutrient dense foods are fruits and vegetables. Uh, so we are the most undernourished environment country now um, and we get enough calories but we don't get enough nutrients so phyto means plant nutrients supplements do not do it you got to eat fruits and vegetables uh, and again it's an energetic footprint the fruit and vegetable comes packed and they work synergistically and you could never do that in a supplement this is actually a really cool picture. Green is a plant-based diet and brown is the beige diet. And anxiety, there's no comparison for the improvement. This is the improvement. 
So they had anxiety and put them on the beige diet. There was pretty much no improvement. I don't know what their diet was before. And we put them, yeah, the general health depression, like they ate beige food and they became more depressed. I don't know what physical role limit means, but I think it means you couldn't run anymore. Uh, fatigue, emotional well-being. Like beige, they had no emotional well-being. Eating fruits and vegetables, right, all right. And I love that picture of the brain. Eat your vegetables and fruits, all right. Eat your greens. So if you're like, ah, I don't wanna eat more fruit, eat a green salad every day. They're really fun to make. Be creative, make a different one each day. You guys have lots of time these days. Um, so George Washington founding, right? Our first president told his troops to forage for wild greens as they were conducive to health and prevented putrid disorders, meaning you weren't constipated and farting all the time. Today, one in 25, one in 25, there's about, well, there's 34 of you, plus me, plus Joey, plus another student. Anyway, it would mean like one and a half of us eat a dozen servings of greens in a month. I eat my greens every day. I have two servings. One is in my smoothie and one is in my salad. Um, and Joey has two salads a day because he's a growing boy. Uh, all right, 20% decrease in heart disease and stroke for every extra serving. So you pretty much can eliminate your chance of heart disease and stroke by eating your greens, eating a salad every day. So this is how it works. So I always have to go through this fast, but this time I get to go through it slow. So greens are filled, and again, you can do your research on this. It would be really fun. CoQ10 um, is found in leafy green, and that is called ubiquinol. And what ubiquinol does is down here, ubiquinol has these extra electron. And so when a free radical comes and takes an electron away from somewhere, ubiquinol gives up its electron. And it goes through it in two steps. And it becomes this guy, ubiquinone. But now it can't do anything. It's stuck. It can't work as an antioxidant again. So ubiquinol is actually, excuse me, it's already there in our mitochondria. So that's where the greens come from. Your leafy greens give the electron to this guy to get you back to the antioxidant. And it negates the free radicals, we did that. So it is because of the chlorophyll in plants gives up electrons, ubiquinone. And this is really cool. If you've never seen the picture, these both are porphyrin rings uh, in hemoglobin and chlorophyll. And so it's another reason it boosts your hemoglobin. Uh, and so the difference is the center. So in plants, the center is magnesium. And so it goes through photosynthesis. And in you and I, it is iron. And so we go through respiration. All right, so eat a salad every day. Uh, your brain is 11 years younger for every green, if you eat greens every day, would you want your brain to be younger? So in the study, the average intake was a tenth of a serving. So I'm like sitting there going, how can you have a tenth of a serving? Is that like one little piece of salad? I don't know. Um, so Cookie Monster's happy. Oh, and you know who else is happy? And this happy and hoppy is your microbiome. Your microbiome absolutely thrives on salad and fruit. My next slide show, we're going to talk about the microbiome a little bit. So you have a choice. You always have a choice. That is what's so beautiful about being in this country. We are so blessed to be here because we have a choice. You can go with the sad, standard American, highly processed diet. Yeah, ramen noodles are there, you guys eating ramens, give them up and go for that leafy green salad. All right, I'm not saying you can never have dessert once in a while, like once a week at something special. So like when John's mom, I forget how old his mom's birthday was back in fall term, said absolutely, you should celebrate and enjoy um, and then move on. Do not do this to your children at Easter. There are other choices. So 
There's the curry. Love curry. Say Sunday, it's pizza Sunday. I always make, I always make homemade pizza. Oh, doesn't that look like an amazing dessert? So why do you even have to have dessert? Make an amazing fruit bowl. Or look how happy she is. Look out there, wasteless. And she's so happy. All right, so smile. So this is an extra credit to either give up something to make a healthy change in April, or if you just start now, um, again, it's due like May 7th. You got to do it for the whole month. Uh, eat a salad every day, every day, not three times a week. It's got to be every day. Go with the three pieces of fruit, like the birthday boy every day. This was his birthday pie uh, one year. I didn't know this was at my mom's house. This was like a 4th of July. Uh, all right, legumes. This is the next slide show is legumes every day. I highly recommend that one. Uh, and it is for the entire month. I had somebody gave up French fries. So she worked as a waitress. I can't remember if I told the story. She gave up French fries because everybody's always buying the waitresses French fries here for the whole staff. So she stopped. She was actually the only one who was 100% successful. And she said, I don't eat French fries anymore. Uh, everybody else had a cheat day. And it happens. I've had people give up fast food. Um, so you can either start doing something. And then at the end of the month, you just write me an email and tell me what you did and what happened over the month. All right. And that is it. So ta-ta. Goodbye. Oh, you get to see my face again. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. I have to stop recording.